everyone. This is Joel Smith with the ASQ Stat Division. Thank you for attending today's webinar. It will be presented by Forrest Breifogel, who's a professional engineer, uh, ASQ fellow. He's on the Board of Advisors for the University of Texas Center for Performance Excellence. We all know Forrest has written a number of books, 13 now and over 100 articles, uh, and uh, as well as his, his most recent books on the enterprise uh, ex integrated enterprise excellence system. Excuse me. Uh, he's received the Crosby Medal in 2004, and is currently the CEO of Smarter Solutions, and has been since 1992. So, I think we we all familiar with Forrest's work, and and we're happy to have him here today. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, everyone on the call, other than Forrest and myself, is muted. So. If you have questions as the presentation goes along or you're having any uh, technical difficulties, please use either the questions or the chat dialog in the GoToWebinar interface, and I'll be able to, to answer those questions as we go. Uh, we'll also be recording this session, and we'll make it available on the ASQ Stat Division website uh, within the next couple of weeks uh, following the presentation. So uh, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Forrest now. And again, we, we appreciate you joining us today, Forrest, and uh, talking about statistical engineering and business management. Thank you, Joel. It's been my perception that a lot of times within the overall business management process, we're not uh, blending and using statistical methods as much as we might. Uh, in particular, how we put together scorecards, how we're actually creating strategies, and also how do we get improvement projects that really benefit the business as a whole. So I'm going to be uh, addressing those uh, type of issues relative to how we can use statistical methods and more integrate it within the overall business management process. So the learning objectives I've got listed here, I want to first off start out with uh, some issues I think we have often with our current process improvement efforts. A lot of times I've noticed that whenever times get tough, uh, often the, one of the first people that get laid off is the people that are working on process improvement efforts. And so to me, that tells me something. And, and I want to address that and see what we might do a little different along those lines. The second thing is we have lots of scorecards within many organizations. But do they really drive the right kind of behaviors? And also, it's been my observation that most of the scorecards that we have are uh, static or like driving a car looking at the rear view mirror. But I'd rather have something that's looking out the windshield. And fundamentally, if we don't like what we, need, what we see, we need to do something fundamentally different. That's applying the brake or turning the steering wheel, which would be a, 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 a process improvement a project analogy. And those predictive scorecards would be statistical based. And then finally, I want to get into pretty much of an enhanced um, uh, system where we're really blending uh, predictive scorecards with analytically and innovatively determined strategies that lead to process improvement projects that benefit the business as a whole. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about or I'll talk about is uh, project selection. If we go in and look at how often projects are selected in programs such as uh, Lean Six Sigma, they're typically uh, addressed from a, a list of opportunities that uh, executive management and others may have put together to, uh, to address. They think it's important. And there can be some really good projects in there. But the problem you can have is a lot of times those projects are not necessarily benefiting the business as a whole. They may be siloed uh, projects. And often we don't have it so that the process owner is really asking for the project to get done and often they die on the vine. We might have training next week, perhaps, on Lean Six Sigma, and we'll always scurry around trying to find projects for everybody. Well, what I'm suggesting, that's more of a push for project creation system within the organization. And it doesn't necessarily help the business as a whole. And the question is, can we go in and put together a system where we really have it so that uh, process improvement projects are uh, determined from a statistical assessment of the enterprise as a whole so that now we can figure out and target improvement efforts so that the business uh, relative to a big picture benefits. And also process improvement owners, are, or excuse me, process improvement uh, 
uh, owners, uh, excuse me, I'll get it right here, uh, process owners are asking for improvement projects that really benefit their organization. So we need to really, in my mind, in order to accomplish that, we really need to readdress our uh, scorecarding system. And I'll be uh, talking a little bit more in detail about that a little bit later. And the idea is that when we want to figure out which metrics we're actually going to have to improve uh, so that, again, it helps the big pictures. But really, fundamentally, I want to lead to is what I call the three R's of business. That is, everybody doing the right things, doing them right at the right time. And the means to accomplish this sort of thinking is the integrated enterprise excellence business management system. Now, if we look at how we will have traditional metrics, often they're creating a static. You might have a table of numbers, you know, and that's listed like there, and it might be annually or quarterly. You might have a bar chart. You might even have the balance scorecard or even red, yellow, green scorecards. These are different ways of presenting information that management often um, uh, is, is attracted to. But typically what you'll get, for example, with a, a table of numbers, you'll invariably get stories from when somebody's looking at it. Say, for example, we look at the third line. Uh, this is dealing with a, a utility um, um, a district within an overall uh, um, uh, community. So we might have from the third line, we might have somebody reporting out this uh, presentation. They might say, you know, in 2002 we staffed up. Uh, anticipating annexations, but they did not happen as quickly as possible as we thought they would. Uh, so our cost per call were up because now they're fifty five dollars and thirty one cents uh, per call. But uh, annexations occurred and in, uh, in two thousand and three, and then our cost per call dropped five uh, five dollars and uh, nine cents. So as we can see, we're on track. Can, can't you hear somebody giving a story like that when they present it? And that's what often really happens when we get information like this. We're, we're really not looking at the variability of the process, and we're not analyzing things statistically. We might have an also a bar chart where we look at the problems of the day, but is that just random occurrences? And are we really fixing things whenever the bars kind of change colors in the next time period? The other thing in the balanced scorecard, look, look at how that's created. We're lining up divisions and strategies all our metrics, and we cascade it down. We might even use Hoshin planning to do this. But often our strategies are worded such that they're like, I want to be the best of the best. But they're hard to get your arms around and lead a lot for interpretation. And finally, the red, yellow, green scorecards. Uh, we're looking at things when it tr triggers from red to green, and we're thinking, well, we made an improvement. But did we really make an improvement? Is, uh, maybe it was just common cause variability. We're not looking at things fundamentally statistically. So often what happens with typical metrics, we might look at things fiscal year. You know, they're also unrelated improvement systems. We might have the people in the north wing of the building working on scorecards and the people in the south wing of the building on process improvement efforts. And they don't talk to each other. So to me, that's a problem. And also we tend to make point-to-point -point comparison. We compare this quarter, last quarter, the previous year. But we're really not looking at the system. What we really have is we really have a system where Y is a function of X. That is the output of the process, the function of the input, and the process itself. Itself. If we don't like Y, then we have to change either the X's or the process improvement. Uh, excuse me, change the X's or the process steps itself. Now, if we have an organization that manages to the Y, you know what that's called? It's called management by hope. We really don't want to have management by hope. So again, if we don't like Y, we need to change X's. But we tend to manage to the Y's. So what we'd really like to do is view the enterprise as a system of processes. So and that they basically all come together uh, to create the enterprise as a whole. We also, in our measurements, we want to include the effective variability. You know, Edwards Deming, as he pointed out, it's so important to, that everybody understands variability within their statement. But our scorecards don't typically reflect variability within the overall statement. And what we really also want to do is support long-lasting systematic improvement. So again, if we don't like what we see on the output, then we need to go in. And it's common cause variability. Then we need to do something fundamentally different. So 
so that the uh, metric is going to be improved long-lastingly in the future. Now let's uh, illustrate how we might look at scorecards a little different. Now this is a true red, yellow, green scorecard. And if you noticed on the right-hand side, we got the most uh, 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 current date of the time period. So management really uh, likes this kind of scorecards because they can look at the last column and if the color is red, obviously we've got a problem. Get Mary working on it or Joe. Oh, gee, what a Sam did a great job. It was red. Now it's green. Get bring out the champagne. And that's typically how we uh, we go in and uh, proceed through our metrics. And that's how we manage the business. But is that the right thing? Are we really driving the right behaviors? Again, we want to lead to the three R's of business. Everybody doing the right thing, doing them right at the right time. So we want to have metrics that lead into the right kind of behaviors. So let's take one of those metrics. And again, this is an actual scorecard that we got permission from one of our customers to use. So I'm going to take that. If we uh, examine it a little closer, we'll notice that we get 33% red and 50% green. Okay? Now, the question is, is that common or special cause. Now, I'm sure everyone on the phone is familiar with common and special cause it is, but uh, I, I think not everybody is as familiar as, as we are relative to what that means using Deming's term. And I like to use this as an illustration to explain it to others. And you might find it helpful also. So let, we can ask somebody the question of, does it take exactly the same amount of time to the second to commute from home to work? And obviously the answer is no. Then we can ask them the question, why? Well, you drove faster one day than the other, or caught stoplights a little differently. You know, maybe traffic was a little bit more than one day than the other. So we basically have some common cause inputs to our overall process of commuting from home to work. Now, if, for example, it took us an hour longer than usual one day, we can talk about that. We could say maybe we had inclement weather or we had a major traffic exam, uh, accident. So we can talk about those particular situations. But if we got just normal up and down variability, we can basically drive ourselves crazy if we talk about all those ups and downs. But that's what happens often in organizations. So for purpose of illustration, let's consider that it takes us between 25 minutes to 35 minutes to commute from home to work. Well, let's say we want to go in and prove that. So we'll say, I want to go in and always make sure that I'm below 33 minutes. So if it's 34 minutes, we try to evaluate, why didn't we not meet our goal? Now, if it's 32 minutes, we say, OK, we met our goal. But as I mentioned, our variability is the common cause variable between 25 and 35 minutes. We really have no right to talk about all these ups and downs. It can drive us crazy. Now, we can build hypotheses to test those out and maybe test various theories we might have on what we could do to improve. Now, that's all fair. And again, that's how we can blend statistical methods to go in and help us figure out where we could focus our efforts through analysis of variance, analysis of means, regressions, and so on. Those can give us insight. But just go in and say we want to meet it is not going to make it happen. So let's consider we started um, talking over with our spouse or significant other. We did a brainstorming session. I said, you know what, if I leave a half an hour earlier, maybe my commute time will be less. So I'm going to do an experiment. I did that and noticed that now my commute time is between 8 to 22 minutes. Well, I not only reduced the average time it takes to commute, but also the variability. So I made a process improvement. Uh, I made process improvement to my overall uh, commute from home to work. But notice I really did something fundamentally different to change. Uh, achieve those metrics. So the point that I'm leading to is I believe that we need to go in and look at and first identify Bogomir's common or special cause variability. And then if we got common cause variability, we need to understand that we need to do something fundamentally different so that the metric actually changed to improvement. So let's go in and look at this uh, scorecard a little bit in more details. One thing we know from it we cannot tell anything about the future from the way it's written here. In the next question, we really don't know if we change, changing from red to green really made a difference. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an individual's control chart of that data. Now, as we see, there's no trends relative to the control limits, and the uh, so and we have just uh, 
a normal up and down variability. So from this, we can kind of conclude that uh, we didn't really make any significant difference. Now, you might say, well, this is just a normal control chart. Well, it is, but it isn't. Okay. Traditionally, control charts are really to identify when special causes occur so that we can stop the presses and fix the problem. So we're taking data in a very quick time period to identify those. So, for example, we've got a manufacturing operation. We're going to do a control chart on a particular machine. We're not going to, we shouldn't look at all these machines together when we actually do these control charts because we might be violating some of the underlying assumptions. For example, the X bar and R chart would have it so that the variability between subgroups has absolutely nothing to do with the control limits. It's only the variable within the subgroups. Now, if we look at this approach for creating control chart, this is what I call 30,000 foot level. So if I got difference between machines, raw material, lots to lots variability, or even days a week, I consider it source of a common cause variability. So when I'm looking at this, then um, uh, I, I, X bar and R charts really don't work so well. And I can, I can send you an article that elaborates on that a little bit more if you like. Uh, uh, and I'll give you the information at the end of this webinar. So what I'm going to use is an individual's control chart, not an X bar and R chart. And I'm going to have the variability occur between the subgroups. And that's what happens with this 30,000 foot level reporting. So as you can see, again, our process is stable. Now, I'm suggesting we don't stop by calendar year or quarters or where. We look over multiple years. We could look at 10 years of data if we got it. And what we really want to do is we want to see if our process is stable. Now, if we got a recent region of stability, we can go in and make a statement that our process is predictable. You know, we're assuming that we need no process improvement efforts and nothing major really happened within the process. So this is somewhat of a best estimate if things maintain how we're actually doing right now is what we can expect in the future. So our recent region of stability, because we could have had stages along the way with this control chart, but our recent region of stability might be three weeks, three months, or three years. Now, the next obvious question is, what do you predict? So what I'm going to do now is take this 30,000 foot level control chart and take the data from the recent region of stability, consider it random sample of the future. I'll then turn that distribution on its side and put the value of 2.2, which is the uh, trigger point for it to turn red. Now, you can see that the area of the curve might be a third of the time it's going to be red. So we're suggesting that this is the percentage of time that we expect it to be um, non-conforming for what we want in the future. Now, a better way of actually determine what that area is a probability plot. So if we took the value of 2.2 and we look at the vertical, vertical percent less than we notice is about 32.6. So that represents the area under the curve. So we basically conclude not only in the latest region of stability, but we have about a 33% non-conformance rate that it's going to be uh, 2.2 or less. So what do we determine? We did not make an improvement with our traditional red, yellow, green scorecards, even though our traditional red, yellow, green scorecard indicated that we did. And we got about a 33% problem. And this is a common cause problem. So if we don't like it, we've got to do an improvement. Now what I'm suggesting, I want to look at scorecards using this approach throughout the organization. This is not just for manufacturing widgets. So first, I want to determine and show if my process is stable. And then if it is stable, create a prediction statement. Now notice how this is consistent with Deming's thought that we need to include variability within our overall decision-making process. So right now, people will have a vision or they'll be able to see, and I'm suggesting throughout the organization, how our process uh, is performing relative to this particular area of the business. Now, I want to have this scorecard written in terms that everybody understands. 
So what I'm suggesting is we put a statement at the bottom that describes how the process is performing. We would basically be saying our process is predictable with about a 32.6% non-conformance. Notice I'm not using CT and CTK and TT and TTK, which can be very confusing for one thing. And also, it can be very dependent upon how people pull samples from their overall process. Where this methodology is pretty much consistent, you're going to have differences by luck of the draw. We have to live with that. But fundamentally, we're going to go in and make statements or ask questions so we can get our variability curve between the uh, uh, subgroups that we're having here. So for example, if we've got a call center and we believe that there's uh, differences between day of the week, then we might have a weekly subgrouping. So again, with 30,000 foot level metrics, we're really not trying to fix anything. We're really trying to give a high level view, a 30,000 foot level view of what the output of the process is going to be looking like to the customer. If we've got a manufacturing process, difference between machines or shifts or uh, a time of day and even cavities of the mold will be all blended together and be part of this overall 30,000 foot level charting. So this is all statistically determined again. Now the question is, does that really improve anything? If we've got great metrics, does it improve anything? Well the answer is no. We really need to now look at and have, in my mind, this form of reporting throughout the organization. Notice how these are metrics are determined statistically, and they got variability included with them. So I'm suggesting, in order to get improvement projects that benefit the big picture, we need to go in and have these scorecards lined up to what we actually do in the business. So I'm suggesting we want to have it so that process steps or procedures are aligned with the output that these procedures are going to create. So that's accomplished in this step two of this nine-step business system. So the idea is we got a vision and mission for an organization. Step two, we're going to create a value chain, what I call it, which is uh, alignment of what you do and how you measure what you do. 30,000 foot level metrics are operational metrics and satellite or financial metrics. Then what we want to do is now analyze the, the value chain and also the business as a whole. Look at what the competition is doing. Look what the economy is doing and so on. We then want to create smart, specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time-based satellite level metric goals. We want to create financial metric goals that are reasonable, not just pie in the sky numbers that are not applicable for our particular uh, business that we're in. And now we want to create strategies that you can get your arms around. I want to create strategies that are not like, I want to be the best of the best. I want to say, gee, in order to prove profit margin with might be a smart satellite goal, I need to go in and reduce my defective rates. Or I need to go in and uh, uh, reduce the time it takes to uh, execute a particular uh, process that we have. Then step number six, I want to identify high potential areas that we need to focus on. And now each manager, there's going to be managers in this value chain that's going to own these metrics. And I want to create goals for them that's going to help the enterprise as a whole. So that the, now the managers are not just saying, oh, I want to do that project, but they understand the completion of these projects are important for their metrics to actually move this 30,000 foot level to a new level of performance that's enhanced and beneficial to the business as a whole. Then we want to execute projects in step seven. Now, if we did a good job, the value chain in, in step two uh, would have its procedures changed such that the 30,000 foot level metrics improved, which then in turn positively impact the satellite or financial metrics for the business as a whole. Then step eight, we want to see how these particular projects impacted the enterprise goals that we're trying to achieve. We then want to maintain the gain. And notice how that loops back, step nine loops back to step number three, not step number one. 
So what do we really have here between step three and nine is an Emmings, a Demings plan to check process for the business as a whole. So this basically describes what I'm actually looking at. Now what I like to do now is describe how you could apply these techniques to an overall hospital. Now this is, I'm pulling now from the, uh, from a server. So this is real-time data collection. So somebody might actually have, and this is what I'm suggesting, they could have this on an iPad. They could have it in their computer. So they're going to be readily accessible to statistically determine metrics throughout the organization in this value chain form. Basically what I'm going to do first is show you how you can have this value chain for a hospital. And the idea behind this is that someone could, could have basically uh, a mini tab and then they could have a flow charting program like uh, Visio or uh, iGraphics and then also this software, this uh, enterprise reporting system software on a server. So the idea is now we would like to have this all dynamic. So like once a day we can pull data from our ERP, ERP system, our spreadsheets or wherever that's readily available through the network and then now we create these kind of charts. So as I mentioned, step two of this nine step process is the value chain. Now the value chain is what you do and how you measure what you do. So I want to link those together. So again, if I do a process improvement project, then it's going to affect my metrics. And I want to create my metrics such that there are these predictive metrics in the 30,000 or a satellite uh, point of view. So this value chain from a hospital is, uh, uh, is basically the main piece of it is voice of the customer. Then we're going to do sales and marketing, deliver clinical services, invoice and collect, report financials. So you can see the main flow of a hospital, the thing that's most important, what customers actually pay for, is to basically flow through here. Hi, Forrest, we have a quick question. Yes. Uh, someone has asked uh, about the, I guess related to the flow charts here, uh, aren't projects executed at the ground level where, where tasks are created and don't we need to understand, uh, understand the interconnections among the processes at the ground level that make up the system? That's a good question. What, what you would be doing when you click through this is this is going to get down to the processes, these rectangle boxes that I'm showing you here, and I'll be demonstrating that a little bit, where now you can click all the way down to the processes and you're going to have metrics aligned to this. This is all clickable. It's HTML. And so, so that I'm going to be kind of getting into that. And uh, maybe if, if I don't go in and answer that question uh, through my uh, uh, dialogue here, then uh, why don't we address that in more detail a little bit later. But I think I'm going to be answering that question here you know, as I go through it. So, the main flow of this here, and this is relative to processes and how they all interconnect, and also the measurements is here, but you're going to have also some port functions. I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the purple, uh, the purple one, the turquoise one here a little bit later. But these are sub-processes that are support. Okay? So now let's go in. I'm going to click on report financials. So now this is, uh, this is the process on the left-hand side here relative to reporting financials, okay. all the, the steps that people have to do. And you can have drill down. And that's just kind of dealing with the question that was just asked. But over on the other side here, what I have is this part here, I have metrics. So these two, right, this one here and this one here is metrics. And these over here are process steps. Okay. Now, if we don't like what this metric is, we might have to change a process somewhere else in the, the enterprise. 
because this is a satellite level metric. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on profit margins. So I see I got a link in the bottom of that. I'm going to click on profit margin. And what it's pulling up is a, a, a charting just similar to what I had previously. Okay? I should have taken this down here. Give you a little more room here. Okay, so uh, so now you can you can see our profit margins here. They've got some variability, common cause variability, between uh, 2004 and 2007. So the idea when we're presenting information like this statistically, we, we don't want to have uh, management at the high level, because this is a satellite. This is profit margin, high level. We don't want to have them reacting to all these ups and down uh, excursions as though it's special cause. Notice I did not say it's a, not, a, not a problem. I'm just saying it's uh, common cause variability. So the idea, if there's special cause variability, we need to react that specifically. In my commute from home to work, if it took me an hour longer, I can talk about that and perhaps I can do something about that. But again, if I got common cause variability at 25 to 35 minutes, I don't like it, I got to do something differently. Or something else could have happened. Well, in this case, you can see the profit margins went down. So we, from our uh, control charting procedure, we said it went down and now, if we've got a recent region of stability, which we do, we can make a statement of how the process is performing. And we only have six points, but that's, uh, you could kind of take what you get. Remember this at a high level, we're not trying to fix the problems immediately. We're trying to describe how things are performing in a statistical fashion as much as we can. So if you look at the statement at the bottom here, you notice that it takes this last six point and puts a statement. Now, if you don't have a specification, what I like to do so that everybody understands the variability associated with it, I like to report the 10, 50, and 90. So if you look at the difference between the 90 and 10, you've got 80. So that represents four out of five times is our expectation how the process is performing. So I put that down in the statement down here, where you notice I got a value of 8 here. I got 11 over here. I put it down here in terms that everybody can easily understand. So what we say, the process is predictable since the last process changed with an estimated median of 9.9 .9 and 80% between 8.6 11.2. So those are in terms that everybody understands. You know, again, this is a financial metric. I'm not, I'm suggesting we don't use CP and CPK and TP and TPK um, in metrics in general. But that's in terms that everybody understands. Okay, so now we've got a problem. It's a common cause problem. Now what we like to look at is the value chain to figure out what we might do differently. So what we're going to do is go back to our value chain. Now we're going to click on it. We look at, these are the metrics we have for voice of the customer. And one of them is customer dissatisfaction. Okay, you noticed here this customer dissatisfaction. Now this is a kind of an attribute. Maybe it was a, a Likert scale and if it was between one and three, which is on the bad side, we call that as unsatisfactory and four to five, we said is good. So we went and looked at it as dissatisfaction. Well, in this case here, it got higher. You can see over here was right about 10%, now it's 13%. But we also include, and I think it's important, is to put, include comments down here. So now you notice here that people are saying, maybe from a survey, these are the kind of problems that we have. Unfriendly staff, a lot of time waiting, and room cleanliness. Okay, that's a clue. You know, we're looking at things statistically here. But that's a clue that could help us. Okay, so we're, let's go in, and we're going to go back again.
Now, if we look at sales and marketing, we could have market share. Again, this is high level view. This is what I call 30,000 foot level view. And again, this is monthly. But you notice our market share went down. If you look at the comments in the bottom, there's another hospital moved in town. Now, if we later decide to change and work on this as a project, we could assign this value over here, or this color over here, to be red if we decide to work on that as a project. So I'm using red, yellow, green scorecards, but really to more focus on common cause improvements as opposed to setting a goal here like this. And if it's above or below this goal, then we go in and that becomes a trigger for activities, which I'm suggesting more often than not, maybe, that we're treating common cause variabilities or its special cause. So again, we're, we're walking through and we're analyzing the data. Let's go now, let's look at delivered clinical services. Now to address the question, uh, Joel, that somebody asked, is we can go now and drill down or have a drill down of this of all our procedures. So I'm just showing you at a high level, but now you can have all your, this become a drill down, all clickable to basically all your procedures. I'm doing one in a clinic here, and it's got a whole um, a list of different functions or different departments that they have, like surgery, internal medicines, and so on. So now you can have those become as boxes, and you click down, and you can get down to the physicians on what they're doing. You can have value stream mapping. Uh, you can also do the more uh, modern type process flow charting called uh, VPMN. You can have that included in there also. So keep in mind, this is Y is over here. And this is the X's over here. And so now we're establishing a relationship. If you don't like your Y here, you need to go in and change your procedures or your X's. So in this particular case, we've got several metrics that are listed over here. Now the only ones that I have data behind are length of stay and weekly air. So I'm going to click on length of stay first. Because this is basically a murder mystery. I'm really trying to focus on what areas of the hospital should we focus on to really get our profit margin back up. That's what I'm focusing on right now. Now, if we notice here, in this particular case, we're going to look at, in this period of time, monthly, or, or weekly, I believe it is, we're going to look at the average value that we have for length of stay and also the standard deviation, or I prefer the log of the standard deviation, uh, since the log rhythm is uh, not normally distributed because it can't get below zero. Okay, so I want to first to see if my process is stable. Remember, this is a two-step process. First, we want to check for stability, which is this. And as we can see, it is stable because the mean value is uh, 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 stable doesn't have any trends relative to the control limits, and also the standard deviation is. So we basically say our process is stable, and then we go back, and now we want to create a prediction statement, and we're going to look at all the raw data when we create this probability chart. Notice I'm not doing an X bar and R chart, or an X bar and S chart. The reason is because the variability between subgroups in those particular charts has absolutely nothing, as in zero, relative control limit, and that's a big deal with this 30,000 foot level reporting. Okay. Now, the, we want to make a statement in terms that everybody understands, and we put this in a statement right here. So we say the median is between 262 and 80% of the current is between 149 to 375 hours. Now, it's, maybe we can't do anything about it, but that's the way life is. But notice also, for our particular analysis where we're looking at profit margin, this did not change. So this is something uh, we wouldn't be working on relative to our improvement of profit margin. So the idea behind this is everybody does not need to improve. 
Now, may, we may want to change that for another reason, but for what we're working on right now, it's not necessary. Now, the other metric that we have relative to operations is errors uh, that we have weekly. So as you can see, it dropped, which is good. But the thing is, uh, uh, you know, relative to our overall uh, question of how improved profit margins, uh, this would not be an area that we focus on for that particular effort. Well, now let's go back and let's look at housekeeping. So I've got cleanliness quality. So let's look at cleanliness quality. So you notice that the quality degraded. You also notice that there were some notes down here that we can apply, such that uh, we outsourced the, uh, the work. And perhaps we didn't have too good of controls on it. OK, so that's another clue for this overall murder mystery that we're working on. So now let's look at patient transportation. And again, remember, I'm just clicking through this. I'm pulling from the, uh, uh, you know, if you're other parts of the world, you could just click through this just as easy as long as you have an internet connection and the right access. So now let's look at diagnosis to bedtime. Well, in this particular case, we did have a goal. We want it to be always less than 30 minutes. But you notice here, we're not doing too well. We only have 7% of the time we're less than 30 minutes. So the way we make our statement of how we're performing is we basically have a 90, uh, almost a 93% non-conformance rate. So we made an improvement, but we're still not as good as we would like to be relative to our objectives. Now remember part of the comment that we had in this fictitious example is that people said they had to spend a lot of time waiting. OK, so now what we want to do is take all this information that we collected through this value chain, and we want to determine where we should be focused on our improvement efforts. So when I'm clicking on this other box over here, this uh, uh, we're going to be noticed that we got the nine-step business system. And we also have an enterprise improvement plan. Now, the enterprise improvement plan starts on the left-hand side, where it has business goals, business goals, strategies, high potential areas, and then leads to projects. Okay. So we're going to start with a business goal. Remember, this would be step, we analyze it, which is step three of the nine-step process. Then we want to create a satellite financial metric goal. That's step four. So what we've done here is we created a satellite level metric goals. And there's going to be an owner of this. You know, that's going to be the CEO that's responsible for that. Now how are we going to do that? We're going to create strategies that are very targeted. We can increase the top line, or we can go in and increase and or increase the customer perspective. Well, how are we going to increase the top line? High potential areas could be in marketing. So now we want to have a marketing manager that owns this function actually be working with the team to actually figure out what should be done differently so that we can return the marketing or, uh, to level that we had far as the uh, market share to a level that we had previously before the competitor moved to town. So that becomes a project goal. And again, now, this marketing manager is going to be asking for this project to get done. Now, we, if we leave, uh, go to improve uh, customer satisfaction, we notice housekeeping and also patient transportation were not doing as well, and they degraded. So we established a goal. We want the housekeeping level quality to move where it had in a certain period of time, you know, like 18 months or 14 months. And we also want to reduce still the diagnosis bedtime uh, to even a better level than what we had previously. So as you can see now, what we have is we got projects that really are aligned to the enterprise as a whole need 
And also there's going to be a process owner that's asking for that project to get done because they're going to be reporting it out to the executive team um, like perhaps once a month. So this basically gives you an idea of the value chain and how you could walk through this overall process to help the overall big picture here. Okay, so I put some slides here that basically describe what I've done here. And uh, I kind of list it just in case uh, the internet connection didn't work out too well. So. And if somebody wants to, uh, uh, so basically what I've got here, I described issues with the current process improvement efforts, also talked about predictive scorecards, and also enhanced business system where you have improvement metric needs full for projects to benefit the business as a whole. So uh, here, if you've got any questions, and, uh, questions, there's my contact information. Uh, you can send me an email if you would like to receive a couple orders, or articles that describe um, the challenges or problems with P-charts and XBAR and R-charts. Also, I have a video that uh, shows uh, basically uh, uh, this overall methodology that we talked about the citable approach. And also, if you'd like to get a, a PDF of the slides, you can send me an email there. My contact information is shown there. So, OK, uh, I'd like to if there's any questions out there. Sure, thank you, Forrest. We had one I wasn't able to, to uh, ask a moment ago, but uh, just in relation to the nine-step methodology, uh, I guess more of a comment would be that, uh, so presumably the, the tenth step would be mapping and connecting all the ground-level processes and uh, defining the appropriate ground-level metrics. I would look at that as far step number two, where now you, that's creating the value chain. So that would be in step two. And you, you would do that at the level of detail that's appropriate, and, but uh, especially when you're doing projects. Like say you're doing a project uh, and you're, you're really working on changing the process of a particular area of the business, and what you would want to do is have that overall value chain drilled down to that particular process. A lot of times what organizations do or they want to do is create all these flow charts and the processes themselves uh, separately and start with a massive effort on that. And what I'm, I'm suggesting, you might not, that may be an overwhelming thing to start with. Now, where if you've got processes that are already documented, what you can do is start putting together them in your overall value chain that I have right here so they become readily accessible to everybody uh, and uh, you know, understanding that there are certain permissions for certain level processes and metrics and so on. But that's what I would do. Uh, in time, and so now you would try to work process improvement and actually document the process as you're going along. So it becomes a nice repository, so people can find them in a, uh, in a reasonable, um, you know, and they don't get lost and uh, that it's all there. And also, you can actually connect to, you know, web uh, browsers and things like that if that's if that's what your organization prefer to do. And also, document the procedures through Word document, Excel spreadsheets, and whatever. Okay, so you would do the ground level uh, before the satellite, kind of thirty thousand foot levels. Well, I would, if I'm going into deployment, I'd, I'd like to go in. If I had my own way, is I'd like to start at the high level. Say, what do you do? Okay, you know, at a high level, and then you could now you go back and you drill like, let's say you're in operations, you click on that, and now you got maybe five different facilities. Uh, you could click on that, or you might have a procedure that's consistent with all across those. So I would drill down to get to that procedure within that, but it's an overall process. But I, I'd be hesitant about doing all your low-level processes because that could be a huge amount of work. But you might be able to put them all in there, uh, the ones that you've already documented in the past. But I think it's important to start with a high-level high level value chain first. Oh, you know, going in, and that's what you know I tell people do in a short period of you know relatively short period of time, because if you don't, you lose sight of the big picture. And what I really want to do here 
is created so that the organization chart is subordinate to the value chain. So if you reorganize, then that's uh, uh, going to uh, uh, not impact your overall value chain because fundamentally you do the same thing. If you're a hospital, you do hospital things. You don't build bridges. And, uh, and so that's, that's my approach would be start at the high level and then if you want to get down to the uh, nitty gritty on the lower level, that's fine, but just have it all interconnected on how you're planning on getting there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And, and by all means, if, if anyone else has questions, please uh, go ahead and submit those now. Um, the only other one we, we have here would be uh, just in terms of goals, but um, one of Deming's major complaints about management setting goals you know, is that they're easy to state and hard to reach, even at the project level. And do you have any comments related to that? I think, well, and I think the point that that's made there is very valid. Because, you know, and because a lot of times we'll do all these process improvement projects, we might do lean, and then we move things around and it's nothing wrong with it, but do we really move the needle? And what I really want to do is create goals that are reasonable, something can be done. Now, if, for example, we've had situations like this, you might have made an improvement, but you did not achieve your goal. And I'm talking about the 30,000 foot level didn't shift to where you want to. See, you can't game it. It's not just a table of numbers that I thought I made an improvement. And now, but now you might have done a really thorough statistical analysis, and you say, uh, in order to do this, I'm going to have to go in and spend uh, uh, $10 million in capital improvement. I'm going to have to do a major IT effort. But now you've got the statistical data to support you and say what you're asking is not possible in order within the constraints that you've done defined. You know, so and now the question is, do we want to take on this massive effort or not? I had one uh, situation was the uh, uh, they made like a, a pharmaceutical product, and you know they came down that they were uh, saying safety. They want to set new goals for safety. Well, that's easier said than done. You know, because uh, once you've gone in and put the uh, 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 constraints on it and make it try as airproof as you can for as cars an injury, you know, it's pretty hard to improve. Um, so when I was uh, talking to the general manager, he says, man, we got these people here, great time, you know, and they start running and then they'll slip and they'll hurt themselves. I said, okay, you got an idea on it is that uh, maybe we put them on, uh, uh, whenever we hire somebody, we go in and put them on, uh, uh, look at them, observe them, and if they go in and look like they're an accident waiting to happen, you know, maybe then we, um, we say, well, you terminate them right away. You know, but the but point is now you've got statistical methodologies that's tracking that, and now we've got to really get together and figure out what we're going to do to make an improvement. You know, see how this is different than somewhat Toyota production system, which basically says you should improve everything. And I'm not against that. If you want to do 5S or something, you want to do a Kaizen event over here in the department, that's fine. But to move the needle, like the person said, can be very difficult. And what I'm trying to do is look at the enterprise as a whole to figure out where you focus your efforts. For exa another example here would be, and I was a keynote at the uh, a major defense contractor, okay, and the general manager was talking about all the lean work they had been doing. I said, oh, it's great, so I toured the facility. The boy, you're doing a great job in lean. I said, but I noticed you got an awful lot of idle equipment. What projects are you doing in sales and marketing? It was as in blank stare. Nothing. Well, that's your obviously bottleneck. It didn't take me a very long time to figure that out. You know, and anybody else could have figured it out too. But when you're looking at the overall value chain, like I have it here, those type of areas um, um, and that need uh, improvement, so the enterprise as a whole benefit become more obvious that we need to work on. And that's what I think the real benefit is uh, to doing it. And also I think relative to the implement of statistical methods, how you put together these charts, how you analyze the enterprise, I think the statistical community, the process improvement community have a, 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 a much better value to the company as a whole when they're involved with this kind of activities on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, not just doing projects or pet projects that somebody might think that's beneficial to them. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap things up here. I will share all the questions with you. So uh, if there's a couple others coming in here that, uh, that we're not answering live, you'll be able to uh, 
respond to them. So again, to remind everyone, this has been recorded, so we will share this on the, the ASQ Stat Division Library on the website, asqstatdiv.org. Um, and again, Forrest, thank you very much for uh, presenting for us today. And uh, we always uh, are, are looking for, for great speakers. We appreciate you, you uh, joining us. So thanks to everyone who attended, and uh, look for more webinars in the near future.